introduction. That's so good. Well, hey, everyone. My name is Gabe Moreno. I'm one of the pastors here. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2 as we continue through this joyful series in a message entitled The Joy of Friendship and how important it is to have good friends and to be a good friend. So you're going to be, uh, again, Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 30. And as you open your Bibles, I want you to think, have you ever heard the expression, preferences become biases. Preferences become biases. Fairly common expression. The idea is that preferences, which is defined as the things that we like over another, and biases, which is to be defined as a prejudice in favor of or against another. So preferences are kind of like mild likes, mild affection. I like pineapple on pizza, the rest of you are wrong that think otherwise, right? I like it. I prefer it. Biases is if you don't like pineapple on a pizza, you need to question your salvation possibly, (laughs) right? Preference, bias, two different things. But our preferences become our biases. Now, why is this important? This is important because if we can be that dogmatic which is to be rigid, in our uh, idea of what is good on a pizza, then we also, if we're not careful, allow spiritual matters to go from being preferences to being biases. Furthermore, because of confirmation bias, which is this idea that each and every one of us are attracted to things that confirm our already previously held beliefs. That's confirmation bias. We tend to make friends with people who agree and who are just like us. No doubt, maybe in your marriage, sometimes you are upset because your spouse doesn't read your mind and do things the way you would want them to do it. If you're anything like me, and I think we all agree, we all confuse preferences and biases. And our world gets really messed up when we operate this way. So much so that the Lord wants to work on us and to work all these things out. The Lord knows you and I, we all need help. Because these biases oftentimes are unbiblical, especially when it comes to how we make friends. So remember, Jesus created something for us to refine us and to mold us into his character. You see, at the end of Jesus' ministry, early on, he called his followers disciples. But later on, towards the end of his ministry, he called them friends. See, friendship, Jesus knew, is how we are more formed into the image of God. You see, think of it this way. Friendship is the crucible for our character. What do I mean by crucible? Crucible, if you know, if you've ever seen this on like, you know, public broadcasts or you watch some documentaries, when there are metal workers who are taking raw materials and they want to refine those raw materials, they place those, those iron ore, or depending on what kind of minerals you're working on, into a container. That ca- container is a crucible. And in there, they begin to heat it up. They apply heat. And over time, the heat is breaking down the impurities of the raw ore. And those impurities rise to the surface. So then, the metal worker scrapes off those impurities and then heats it back up again. And then waits some time. And then those impurities rise up again. And then scrape them off and turn the heat back on again. This process is repeated and repeated and repeated until eventually... The creator looks into the crucible and he sees his reflection. This is what Jesus is trying to do in your life through his word, through church, through prayer, through worship, but also through friendship. Friendship is the crucible for your character. Friends, you were created for relationships. But oftentimes we settle for cheap substitutes. We befriend all kinds of bad stuff simply because it conforms to our biases. We do it all the time. We make friends with the wrong things. Jesus' half-brother knew this. And he warned the believers. He, He warned them. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? See, he knew that they had that weakness in them. He said, whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. The big picture today for us is that we must seek out those relationships that always point us back to Jesus. Real friends 
If you're writing anything down, this is a good criteria for your friends. Real friends are honest with you and honest about you. Real friends are honest with you and honest about you. They're going to be honest with you. Hey, uh, Pastor Gabe, you got a little chia seed in your teeth right there, that giant enormous gap you have that you inherited. You got a chia seed in there, Pastor Gabe. Honest with you, right? Um, But they're also going to be honest about you. Like, bro, you talk about yourself a lot. (laughs) You know? They're going to be honest about you. The best friends, the friends that you have in your life. Think about them. You all have them. Maybe you stopped calling them because they were so honest with you and honest about you. I don't, I don't know. Shame on you. You need to call them. <laughs> but real friends um, are the ones that God has placed in your life because they're honest with you and honest about you. So before we read our passage, I just want you to imagine, what would our church be like? What would our county be like? What would this state be like? What would Washington state be like? What would our region, our country, what would the Middle East be like considering everything that's going on there right now? What would it be like if everyone there chose today to not only do what Jesus did, but they made it their life's goal to be the kind of friend that Jesus is and the kind of friend that Jesus was? That, my friends, is the joy of friendship. And we're going to learn about it, how Paul found it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. So with your Bibles there, we're going to read this together and then we'll go back and look at it verse by verse. We begin in verse 19. As Paul writes, while in prison... Uh, to the church gathered there in Philippi. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick, almost unto death, But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice and may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service, towards me. Essentially, what we have in this short section is a character study. We're looking at two groups of people, or two people. We're looking at Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy, his name in the original language means honoring to God or God's honor. Epaphroditus, his name means love or charm, one who is loving. These are really important elements that you need in your friendship. Now, the trick is, we're going to do two things. We're going to read about these characters, these guys, and then ask ourselves, do I have friends like this? And then really, maybe the more important question, the second question we'll ask is, am I a friend like that? Right? Do I have friends like this? Am I a friend like that? That is our hope. So in verse 19, we see that Paul, his greatest encouragement was to send Timothy to a group of people who were concerned for him. He says, I want you guys to be encouraged. What we know about Timothy, and this is the first thing that you should realize, is ask yourself this, do I have a friend like this? Do I have a friend who sticks around during hard times? Timothy was there while Paul was in prison. Timothy was right there ministering to him, and he was so valuable to Paul that it's something we need to realize, like, where can I find a Timothy? It's something that we're called to do. Go and find a Timothy. Not only that, but Timothy was also someone that could go out and encourage people no matter where he was. Now, I believe that there are two kinds of people. Some of us are encouraging, let me say it this way, some of us are more of a blessing whenever we leave a room. (laughs) Like as soon as you leave, the whole room's like, thank God, my guy is the worst. You know, like (laughs) some of us are just that way. 
<laughs> Some of us are more of a blessing, more encouraging whenever we leave. Timothy, conversely, ask yourselves, do I know a friend like that? Am I a friend like that? Timothy was, a, was encouraging, was a blessing wherever he went. Does that make sense? Ask yourself, are you a blessing wherever you go? Encouragement is so powerful. It is just so powerful. It costs you nothing, and you can be so generous with it. You guys, encouragement has the power to restrain sin. Let me give you an example of my own life. You know, I talked about preferences and biases. In college, even towards the end of high school and all through college, I, I, I worked as a waiter. I worked in restaurants. And in one of my restaurants that I worked in, they always told us no wasted trips. So the idea was no wasted trips. So the idea is if you're walking out to a table because you just got sat a new table, on your way out there, you should probably be bringing another table's food or maybe bringing water, right? Because you're going out there. Don't waste a trip. It just makes sense. And then once you take their order and you're going back to the kitchen, well, you might as well pick up some dirty plates because no wasted trips. You should, no wasted trips. This is, I mean, it's common sense. This is why I prefer to work this way and I often need encouragement because my preference becomes a bias and I get super critical, not like any of you do, of your children, right? Like I'm sitting in the living room and my son, God bless him, uh, he plays like a lot of sports. So he has not clean socks. Like these things are rock solid. When he takes them off, they stand up by themselves. <laughs> Slight exaggeration, but they like, I don't know, how, he's got to chisel them off his feet. Like I don't know how they come off. What boggles my mind is um, I'm sitting there in the living room. You know, I'm watching my beloved Chiefs. And like he goes upstairs to his room, but he leaves his socks downstairs. And in my mind, I'm just screaming at him, no wasted trips. And my wife, she can feel it. And she knows in my heart, I'm judging my son. I'm frustrated with my son. I'm like speaking death over my son a little bit. Got to repent, Jesus. Uh, <laughs> and my wife does something that I think all of us can do. We talked about this earlier. She gives me a look like, And then I'm looking, I'm like, I know, but no wasted trips. Hey, come on, it's the right way to live, you know. And, um, and then I'm like, son, I don't understand how you're going up to your room and you leave your concrete blocks uh, on, the, on the foot of the stairs. And then my wife has to ramp up her encouragement. Now ramp up her encouragement. There's no more, no more, this doesn't suffice. It, it, now it's a, a thigh squeeze. And this girl works out, so her grip strength is like pretty legit. You know, so I'm like, yeah, but I still, it's not enough to restrain the tongue because I have to let them know that there's only one way to live, no wasted trips, you know? And so her encouragement is not getting through. And I am sinning, everybody, I'm sinning. And, 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 and I'm just going off on my son and he's looking at me like, what, bruh, you know? <laughs> like looking at his phone, okay, bruh, you know? And um, so I'm getting squeezed. And so that's the touch. And then finally... My wife has to use the most powerful form of encouragement. Um, she has to remind me who I am, right, as I'm getting mad. And she just says, she doesn't have to say much. She's like the Holy Spirit, my wife. She goes, Pastor Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate trump card, right? And, and, and then instantly I'm like transported back into my body. And then I'm like, thus saith the Lord, son, you should repent. You know, I'm repenting. <laughs> Encouragement. We can give it or we can be stingy with it. But it costs you nothing. Sometimes, it, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's just a look. Someone comes late to church and instead of being like, <laughs> um, you're like, dude, what up? You made it. You're not late for today. You're early for next week. <laughs> My guy, you're here, you know? Like sometimes it could just be a, it could be a look. It could be a, a shake their hand. Man, let me move my stuff. Get over here. You're, you're using your touch, right, to encourage because they're late, but you don't want to put them on blast. And then maybe you just got to give them a big hug and tell them, man, I'm so glad you're here. That's awesome. Friends, encouragement is free. It costs you nothing, and you can give it, and, it, and I believe it has the power to restrain sin because I see it in my own life. Timothy was an encourager wherever he went. 
And Paul didn't want to hoard that. He was like, hey, we got you, bro, we got to send you down to Philippi. Those dudes are worried. They need you. You know, he goes on to say about Timothy, he says, look, like this guy has my same exact mind, he says, which is such a powerful thing to say in verse 20. We're like-minded. He's like, I don't have anyone who sincerely cares for you guys like, like he does. You know, uh, C.S. Lewis had a quote about friendship. And I think maybe, maybe you guys have experienced this. He said, friendship arises when two or more of the companions discover that they have in common some insight or interest or even taste, which the others do not share and which, till that moment, each believed to be his own treasure. The typical expression, I love this, listen to this. Disregard everything else, listen to this. The typical expression of friendship would be something like, What? You too? I thought I was the only one, right? That's what Timothy and Paul shared. When Timothy said, I, hey, Paul, I think I should go and check on the guys at Philippi. They're super worried. Are you good, bro? I think at that moment, Paul looked at Timothy and was like, what? You, you too? I thought I was the only one that cared for them like that. Do you have friends like that? And are you a friend like that? Ask yourself. Do you have a Timothy? If not, we got to find a Timothy. We simply have to. Now, in a room this size, this is the hard part, you guys. In a room this size, a lot of us are like, look, I don't want to go out and find a Timothy because I've been hurt in friendships before. And that's real. And that's honest. And my heart goes out to you. But I want you to read this quote. I'm going to read it over you. It'll be on the screens. Another C.S. Lewis quote that I think speaks to that a little bit. To love he writes, at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. Yes, amen, C.S. Lewis, right? With the zinger, is just so good. So the idea, we need to go out and find Timothys, but maybe for some of us we've been hurt and we're afraid to be that vulnerable. Friends, if that's you today, Jesus is the cradle of security in your moment of vulnerability. He wants you to step out in vulnerability, to go and put yourself out there. And I know for a lot of you, like, but yeah, but I don't know how. Crossroads is a big place. How do I get connected? Listen, just yesterday, just yesterday, I was at Second Saturday. We had over 200 people there. We made over 81,000 meals for hungry kids. 81,000. Amen. And that was amazing and beautiful and it took all day and it was hot and, and whatever and it was hard and there was a lot of wasted trips, if I may say. A lot of wasted trips. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? For me, what was more impactful, I, I'm, I met a lady who lived in my old hometown who ended up at Crossroads because her sister who lives in Holland, couldn't even point that out on a map, Holland watches online and told her to go to Crossroads. I know, that connection. Uh, I met another group of people, uh, a Celebrate Recovery team who serves at Celebrate Recovery. They have a small group. They came just to serve at Second Saturday. And we hung out and they're like, I never thought I'd be coming to church, let alone leading a CR group. Maybe a year from now, that guy might be my Timothy. Maybe a month from now, I'll be his. I don't know. But friends, you will never find a Timothy if you're sitting on the sidelines. You must get connected. If it's not second Saturday, it's Harvest Jam coming up. If Harvest Jam is too far away, it's serving on a weekend. If, if that's too much, it's joining a small group in the midweek. If that's too much, it's joining the small group online and praying for people. I don't know what your level of engagement and involvement is, but I know that if you need to find a Timothy, you have to get connected and you won't find one sitting on the sidelines. So we have to get out there. Okay. So you guys with me? We're still tracking. Okay, good. Verse 25, let's continue. So we need to find a Timothy. Let's make it the, tar the target even more narrow. Now we got to find an Epaphroditus. So let's, let's find out what he was like and maybe see if we measure up, right? 
find an Epaphroditus. Verse 25, yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Who was he? He was my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs. See, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. And for indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him to you to be to more eagerly pardon, that when you see him again, you may rejoice and be less sorrowful. We know Timothy was a close friend, maybe even a son. We know Epaphroditus is referred to as a brother. This is why at Crossroads we believe, because Jesus is real, we are a family of faith, and what do we do? We are fully engaged. Engaged in what? Transforming our communities and our world. This is the kind of friendship we need and the kind of friend we need to be. Look at this. This is really, really cool. We see that if you want to have family, this is really important. If you want to fa find family here at Crossroads or within the broader Christian context, you won't find family if you willingly choose to live like an orphan. And that's just the truth. As C.S. Lewis told us, to love is to be vulnerable. What is the alternative? Is that your heart would be safe, dark, motionless, airless, and it will change. It will not be broken, but it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. That's the alternative. That's not a way to live. I don't want to live that way. I want to live the way Paul lived. He's sitting in prison and is writing one of the most joyful letters he's ever written to a group of people who are hurting because they found out that Paul's in trouble and Epaphroditus is sick. And he's like, I just want to encourage you guys. I don't know about you guys. That's how I want to live my life. You see, Epaphroditus was so awesome because not only was he a brother, right, because he chose not to willingly live like an orphan, um, but he was also a fellow soldier, a fellow worker. He was fully engaged and engaged through prayer and ministry. He was a messenger, we read here in this section, which means he delivered the gospel. He didn't edit it. Friends, ask yourselves, do your friends bring the word to you, but do they tweak it? Do they twist it for their own agenda? God wants messengers of his word, not editors. Ask yourself, what kind of friends do you have, and are you that kind of friend? Not only that, he was a minister, which is to say he was a servant. You see, God loves people with a servant heart, but we could serve for the wrong reasons. You see, I think there's two kinds of people here in, in the church in general. This is broad strokes, okay? You're either a contributor or a consumer. The contributor comes to church and they say, I am seeking Jesus first, once I seek Jesus, I'm going to find out how I can bless others. And then third, I'm going to find out what God has for me, for the you. You see that? Jesus, others, you. That's our series title, Joy, Full. How do you experience fullness of joy? Jesus, others, you. But the consumer is different. The consumer is, this, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to go to church to see what I can get out of it. Someone better thank me. Someone better acknowledge me. Someone better say, Pastor Gabe, your message today was straight fuego, um, right? <laughs> and it happens from time to time. We all come to church with different motives. But when we put ourselves on the throne, right, that's idolatry. So you put yourself first, and then you're like, well, I'll go for, to see what I can get out of it. And then hopefully others, maybe I'll find some friends. That'd be kind of cool. And then at the very end, if I get around to it, I'll see what Jesus wants from me. You see the inverse order? You see, someone who's got a servant heart for the right reasons, any time that they leave, whether they leave a room, leave a ministry, or leave the church, sometimes people just move, you guys, right? When they leave, they leave a legacy. When a consumer leaves, well, I'm leaving because I didn't get my parking spot and my coffee was lukewarm and they use sugar-free instead of non-sugar, decaf, whatever, uh, you know, all the list of complaints, when they leave, they don't leave a legacy, they leave a vacancy. It's what happened when I worked in, in restaurants. When someone was upset at the quality of service and they left, they left an angry note, they left an empty table, they left dirty plates, they left an attitude. That was the vacancy they left behind. And one of the legacies that I'm trying to build with my kids, anytime we go to the movies, 
I always feel bad because uh, like the movie theater is always so messy when everyone leaves. It's like if people are getting paid or they're getting a discounted ticket by making a mess. Like you see the like popcorn bucket, you know, soda, you know, it's like, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to leave a vacancy. So I'm like, guys, what if the movie theater was cleaner after we left than when we got in? What if your job, what if the office was more Jesus focused after you left at the end of day work? What if your house was more worshipful after you left because you left a legacy and not a vacancy? That's the kind of man that Epaphroditus was. That's the kind of friend you need. And definitely that's the kind of friend you need to be. So Epaphroditus was kind of that guy. Uh, I love that. He knew people were worried because he was sick and he was concerned about that. He was concerned that people were concerned. Who does that? What kind of friend does that? It's just so awesome. You know, he wasn't self-focused. I'm so sick. Everyone pay attention to me. No one's riding me. You know, the consumer mindset, you guys, it's, it's really interesting and tragic. Uh, what, I, what I've also found in relationships is that people who have a consuming mindset, they make a list of disappointments. And they just focus, meditate on that list, right? He didn't call my birthday. He got me the wrong color sweater. He got me uh, Blue Star Donuts instead of Voodoo Donuts, or instead of Angels, because I'm sanctified. Um, <laughs> he got me last year's iPhone, not this year's iPhone, because he hood like that. You know, um, right? You make a list of disappointments. Consumer, contributor, you make a list of deposits. Oh, man. Like, it's crazy that they would text me on, on my birthday. Who even thought they would remember? That's so cool. Oh, man. Like, yeah, they prayed for me that one time when I was sick. I, I need to thank them for that. Do you make a list of disappointments or do you keep track of deposits? Only one of those people is joyful. I'm just trying to give you those consistent themes in the lives of these people so that you could experience that in your own life, so that you can search for those friends, and so that you can be that kind of friend. That's the kind of person that Epaphroditus was and it's super important. Now, you might be thinking, oh, that's very nice, Pastor Gabe. So the big thing here is go out and find the two most impossible unicorn-type friends out there in the world. Uh, super encouraging, Pastor Gabe. Wow. Uh, you thought a lot about that one, you know. <laughs> and yeah, sure, maybe that's the base message is, yeah, find a Timothy, find an Epaphroditus if you're going to experience the joy of friendship. But I think a deeper message is, that's a very narrow target, aim small, miss small. It might be really, really hard to find someone with this level of integrity, with this kind of consistency and accountability, or is it? Jump down with me to verse uh, 29 and 30. Check this out. Receive him, that's Epaphroditus, therefore in the Lord, with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his own life, to supply what was lacking in your service. What we see here in these last two verses, we need to honor people who are this way. So if you want to find them, you got to honor them. Are you honoring people who are like this in your life? Are you keeping track of people who fit this criteria? Another question to ask, no one wants to ask it, are you even honorable? So many, so many times in marriages, husbands are like, pastor, now you set her straight. She won't respect me. And I'm like, brother, are you respectable? Because I don't know about that, you know. Uh, <laughs> I can't just command her to respect you. Are you respectable? Come on. Do you have integrity? Friends, integrity is what you do when no one's looking. That's really what it is. We live in a culture that cares about fame because fame is rooted in reputation. But the Bible runs counter to that. The Bible says, focus on character, which is rooted in integrity. And when you focus on character, God will take care of your reputation. Who cares about fame? Jesus was famous and it got him killed. Why do you want fame? Integrity, character, these things follow reputation. Jesus had that. But if we want to attract friends like this, as impossible as it seems, we have to honor the people in our lives that God has placed. And we ourselves have to be honorable. Or else, what are we doing? What else did these people do? They didn't regard their own lives. That means, in the original language, it means they gambled their lives. They knew it was risky. Do you have friends that are willing to lay their lives down for you? Again, in marriages, we, and, the, and the pastors and I do a lot of marriage counseling, 
And so oftentimes we see these men or women make these grandiose statements like, honey, if a man broke into our house, I would lay down my life for you. And she goes, babe, um, that's great. Could you load the dishwasher? He's like, I cannot. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord, the man, the man shall not load the dishwasher. It's like, bruh, to quote my son, bruh, right? They gambled their lives. Are you in a marriage like that? Do you have friends like that? Are you a friend like that? Where you lay your life down? What does the Bible say about Jesus? That he says, no greater love than this, than a man shall lay his life down for friends. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. If you can't find a Timothy and Epaphroditus, you already have one. It's Jesus. Our third point, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend. What a tremendous friend. He's the only friend in the world who laid his life down for you and for me and asked for nothing in return. He loved you so much it cost him his life. And you have friends who get, get upset because you didn't text them on their birthday. Come on. Or you're that friend who throws shade because someone watched an episode of Ahsoka on Disney Channel and posted about it on social media and then you read about it and it was spoiled for you. I'm not speaking from personal experience. I'm not upset at that person. I've already gotten encouraged by my wife about that, so I'm good. I'm good. But that's the kind of friend that we have in Jesus. No other, no other world religion promises you that you could be friend of God. Every other world religion, go ahead and study them. I dare you to. Every other world religion will tell you you have to do something to earn God's love. Christianity stands alone. It stands unique in saying it's already been done. That's how much Jesus loves you. That's the kind of friend he wants to be in your life, and he wants to make you into that kind of friend. Turns out our parents were right. Whenever we were hanging out with the wrong crowd, and they would say, hey, you're becoming just like so-and-so. Only this way we could turn it. We can flip that on its head, and we could actually become just like the person we're hanging out with. If you spend time with Jesus, you could be that friend. And there are plenty of people who are looking for that kind of friend. But you got to seek him first. For a lot of us, we idolize friendships. Oh, if I could just go to church and meet five people and the Lord has 10 around you, be like, yeah, but I don't like those. I want those cool group over there or I want that group over there in leadership or I want this group of people over here, right? You're making lists of disappointment, not keeping track of the deposits. We gotta repent from that. You can't make friendship the idol and it's a subtle one. One of the things that breaks my heart, speaking about marriage, is when I see couples kind of trash people, their spouse, publicly. You know, maybe the wife is telling the story. Yeah, you know, we were outside during the yard sale and my husband was blowing the leaves and my neighbor drove by in their new 57 Chevy, you know, remodel, whatever. And the husband's like, oh, babe, it wasn't a yard sale. We were cleaning the gutters, duh. And uh, he wasn't a 57 Chevy. It was a 56. Okay, get it right. Anytime I see a couple publicly correct their spouse over a trivial detail that doesn't add to the story, it breaks my heart. Because I know that each person in that marriage knows exactly how to be a good friend. Because you, you guys fake it for your bosses all the time. The boss tells a joke that isn't funny. <laughs> Sorry, oh my God, you are so funny, bro. Right? Oh, it's my boss's birthday. We got to show up early to work. Oh, it's my boss's birthday. We better buy a cake. You know how to be a good friend. You fake it all the time for people who don't even care about you. But, but we're not willing to do it for the people who we live with, the people we go to church with, the people we serve with. What if you can never find a Timothy or an Epaphroditus? You need to be one. What if you can't be one? You already have one. You have a friendship with Jesus if you put your faith and trust in him. And as we close, uh, I wanted to read a, a lyric over you, some lyrics. Uh, written by a man named Joseph Scriven. He was born in the 1800s. He, he went to seminary. He was a smart guy. He was a really, really strong guy. They said he was very generous, but very quiet. Uh, uh, he cut wood like on the side and he was like a big burly lumberjack guy. He was super tough, but he was always very quiet and always alone. He, he was married once and his wife, um, she died. Uh, she fell off a horse, tragically drowned, super sad. And then he was remarried. He, he risked it all. He was vulnerable, met someone, became friends, and they got married. And uh, she died of pneumonia. So he lived the rest of his life as a pretty quiet, strong man. It was said people would try to hire him to cut wood, 
but he would only cut wood for uh, orphans and widows, people who couldn't do it themselves. It was the kind of man he was. Towards the end of his life, um, he died tragically um, as well. But towards the end of his life, he wrote a poem, a famous poem. And I pray that these lyrics don't allow you to rest until you find or become a friend like this. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Timothy, Paul, Epaphroditus, Joseph Scraven's wives all died. We can get sad and make a list of disappointments, or we can keep track of the deposits. In that, people who die remind us that their friendship is impermanent, but Jesus' friendship is everlasting. And you can put your faith and trust in him today. I want to give some of you that opportunity here today. With your eyes closed and your heads bowed, pray with me, won't you? Heavenly Father, I thank you for my Crossroads family, Lord. I thank you for just the wonderful encouragers that they all are. I thank you, Lord, that we're people of the word, that we want to worship you. We want to grow more like you. We want to become closer to you. We want to be Jesus in a world that doesn't want to acknowledge you. Lord, I pray even now, if there's anyone who's been hurt by a past friendship, a close friendship, Lord, would you bring healing? Would you bring courage for them to step out and be vulnerable once again? Lord, we don't want hard hearts. We don't want impenetrable, irredeemable hearts, Lord. We want a heart of flesh, a heart that you can use and mold into your image. Make us more like you, Lord. We repent of any preferences or biases, Lord, that have gotten in the way of relationship. If there's no biblical reason for it, Lord, we don't want it because it creates, it creates a barrier, not a bridge. And so, Lord, move in those instances. 